yeah i was gonna ask how do you do the auditing groups in the auditing form do they have like a like a formal work setup where like you know it's a, a process that the firm goes through when doing like audit with like two or three or four auditors or is just kind of like a touching feel yeah it's mostly well at sigma prime we do it slightly differently because we actually focus quite a lot on writing pocs as well so there's the first part of the audit where it's pretty comparable to like a spare bit or oak security or any type of situation where you're working with multiple auditors as a team where you just uh, go through the code base and then bounce ideas off each other and then there's a second part where we sort of add extra tests and pocs and all that um so I guess that is pretty specific just to uh, Sigma Prime. Uh, but for other auditing firms, uh, I'm not sure if you've done a spare bit audit. Uh, Pashoff, you've done a couple of spare bit audits. Uh, does that sound pretty similar to what happened at spare bit? Yeah, it's very, co very collaborative. I mean, uh, something very interesting uh, when you're on a spare bit audit is that uh, you have this pull request with all the changes all the code is in a pull request in GitHub. So there, whoever is the first one to find some issue, he immediately comments on the pull request and uh, adds like a, a comment saying, uh, there is a problem here, you need to do X, Y, Z. And uh, yeah, sometimes you get front front uh, in finding a security vulnerability, but this is not always a bad thing. Uh, but yeah, it, it's very collaborative, but uh, speed is important there, so, um, so you can be maybe the, the first one that is finding the issues. Uh, but uh, this does, doesn't really matter at the end, because when you're doing a teamwork, uh, it's not the individual, it's basically the, the end product, that's what's important. Yeah, I recently did an audit that was also happening at Spearbit at the same time, so we were auditing the same repo. And it just made me wonder if I should set something similar like that for private audits where like you, you do a directly like a pull request in GitHub. But at the same time, it's just the formality of it kind of hinders the back and forth you can get just like on a chat or something. I was wondering if Bashop had an opinion about it. Like, did you ever think about setting up a similar structure for your private audits? Um, not really, because this, this adds some overhead to the process, so I'm not doing this at the moment. Basically, I'm just uh, auditing from, from VS Code, cloning the repository locally. And uh, if I get some higher severity issues, I usually immediately report them to the team, especially if the code has already been deployed, because I have done audits on already deployed code. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't used this process. I mean, this helps a lot to be more collaborative with other people in a team. And also, I think uh, Spearbit has developed this tool that will automatically generate the report for you from um, issues in GitHub, which is very nice, very good, very, uh, great automatization. But uh, I'm not using it at the moment. I mean, I'm doing everything manually. Uh, it, it needs some improvement, but right now this is the process for me. Yeah, I don't think I've done private audits with a team yet. But I'll be open to it for sure. Yeah, I think it would be an interesting experience. I've done a few contests um, like uh, in C4 with other people, but never a private audit, which I think it could be really good. Do you Have you done some of these, Pashov? Yeah, so uh, actually I have been uh, trying to do this a little bit. I mean, I have been thinking a lot about this because when you're doing well as a sole auditor, I mean, you're getting a lot of clients, you're getting a lot of business, and you're thinking about how you can scale this business. You have a lot of opportunity. And in, in some days, you have to turn clients down because you are uh, fully booked until the end of the month or whatever. And uh, also, you would like to delegate some, some things to other people and whatnot. So what I have tried is... Uh, just a few things. I have included some of my uh, my personal real life friends who are doing some Web3 security on my audits. But uh, the model that I have done this is is pretty complex. But basically, I do the full audit myself, and they they also do uh, an audit by themselves. But usually, they they just find duplicates to my issues and they miss some high severity ones, some medium severity ones. If they even find a few medium severity ones, it's good, it's good for them. I still pay them something like a, 
like the reward pot from uh, from a code arena contest, the the QA part, the QA part maybe, and uh, it it works kind of kind of well. But uh, this is mostly in in their benefit. I mean, they are learning a lot being on a on an actual audit, and they are also getting paid. But I don't get too much of a benefit because I'm doing the work anyway. I'm doing the complete audit anyway. And if uh, a researcher is uh, pretty more junior than me, I mean, he w is not expected to find any more issues that I'm from those that I'm finding. But but still, I, I, I have done this a few times and it has worked pretty well. I mean, I'm building a better relationship and helping people uh, improve in the space. So it's good. Yeah, that's an interesting model. Actually, I've seen quite a lot of people post on Twitter. They've started to work um, as a team doing solo audits. I think um, with a lot of um, projects needing audits, which I'm actually quite surprised because we're sort of in a bear market at the moment and um, having having the orders pick up at this time, which, yeah, like Pashov, um, how do you actually see the marketplace at the moment? Are you seeing more projects approaching you for an order or are you seeing it sort of slowly drop off a bit? Because um, uh, uh, some people say there's, um, it's starting to dry off because, uh, you know, C4 contests and Sherlock contests are uh, starting to, you know, reduce in numbers just recently. Yeah, I could really say that it's, um, the market is in ups and downs, especially from my point of view, because uh, my point of view is what DMs I'm getting, because right now I'm not doing some out outbound stuff. I mean, I'm not uh, actively approaching protocols. Usually protocols are approaching me. And uh, I can tell you that for the past two or three weeks, I have been uh, getting a lot of inflow. I mean, uh, it's comparable to the previous months, to, to January, February, uh, maybe in March, in March, and maybe even a little bit more. But, uh, but yeah, it really depends. I mean, sometimes the protocols have uh, very small budgets, like uh, two or three K. And sometimes protocol have uh, bigger budgets, like 10K, 20K, or even more. Uh, so this is pretty important because I think you always have lower budget clients. So audits are a perfect fit for uh, protocols that are uh, from solopreneurs, some w from one developer that is self-funded or, or whatever. This is a great fit for such uh, protocols. But those ones usually have a smaller budget to work with. Um, I think I think there is demand. Certainly, I, I feel there is demand. I see other auditors getting audits as well, and uh, yeah, the market is doing well. Yeah, something that I'm at the moment more in the ideation phase. I don't really have the the total flow mapped out. I'm still trying to brainstorm how that would be a best to play because I, I want to be able to vet people and whatnot. But to incorporate something in the saloon where you can form teams and then like get booked through the platform and just to facilitate because at the moment if you want to do private odds with a team it's a bit of a loose process and you don't really know like coming from like the project perspective it's kind of hard like if you just want to you know oh i like this guy and i like that guy and you don't really know how to you know make them connect to each other or you just go to like a a firm if you want to like uh, that group experience without knowing individual auditors, if that makes sense. So what sort of interesting uh, projects uh, have you worked on recently? Uh, have there been any standouts? Um, yeah, I have been working on some interesting ones, I guess. Uh, I have found that, by the way, I have uh, analyzed a bit of the projects that I have been doing audits on. And you can see almost maybe 95% of them in my audits repository on GitHub. You can see what type of protocols they are. Um, and most of them are, are not like heavy DeFi protocols because I think those ones are usually very well funded and uh, the investors are demanding some uh, very big company to do the audit, like a trail of bits or whatever. And uh, so usually smaller projects go for a solo auditor at the moment. And I have seen that a lot of the protocols that I have reviewed have been doing something with uh, NFTs or with semi-fungible tokens. Um, 
So yeah, my, my latest audit that I, I published was uh, one that uh, dealt with NFT games uh, with uh, using layer zero as a technology, so multiple chains integrated. Um, and it, it was a pretty interesting one. I managed to find some uh, interesting uh, issues, but I have noticed that uh, when it comes to NFTs, I don't know why, but I think NFT, uh, to, to be developing a protocol that integrates with ERC-721, ERC-1155, it's a bit easier than doing uh, very complex uh, DeFi logic, uh, economical stuff. And I think a lot of developers go into th this direction uh, sooner. So I feel like there are a lot of uh, common vulnerabilities there in such, such protocols. But uh, from a developer standpoint, I think uh, you can be very successful with such a protocol because with the financial protocols, with the DeFi protocols, it's a bit harder to, to do it right and to get people on board it. But with NFTs, there is the factor of the generability, uh, you can call it, and uh, people just want to hop in and have, have some fun with it. So, so it works and people make a lot of money. And that's why NFT protocols are actually starting to have bigger budgets for audits, even for sole auditors. The latest ones that I've done have one of those around an NFT things as well, but the most recent one, it's a kind of protocol that I've never seen something similar. I think you might, you guys have, might have heard of Sablier. That's the most recent one I audited, which is like a streaming token protocol, which is, I would say it's DeFi, but it's not the, the classic DeFi that you usually get when you're auditing protocols. So that was probably one of the most unique protocols I've audited just because it's, it's totally its own thing. It doesn't really fork anything or take ideas from anywhere. It's its own thing. And it was a really well written code base. It was, it was really good. And how roughly how large are the code bases um, that you're auditing, uh, Hake? I usually small code bases. Um, yeah, usually on the smaller side because I'm trying to focus on Solon most of the time. So if a project's too big and I have to commit more than a week and a half, I usually just back away from it. And I think Pashoff, you've started to like you started with really small projects, and you've recently been like getting more and more bigger clients. Is that right? I have gotten some bigger clients, but uh, most of the last ones have been not not so big of a code basis, and uh, I have found that if if I'm thinking in business terms. Usually, smaller code bases will will uh, require less time, but I will be making more money per hour. But I will still be providing a great service to a client, building my brand and everything. But uh, I don't know it's hard to decide because if you get on an audit, which is let's say um, 300, 300, 3,000 lines of code, uh, it will require probably probably a month for me. I mean, that's that's what I, it will require for me to do the audit, right? Because if I do so, an audit, I cannot half ask it. I mean, I have, I have to do it well. Um, I cannot miss any critical issues, at least some obvious ones shouldn't be missed. So I have to do a great job. And uh, there is a lot of opportunity cost uh, related to this. I mean, if I take an audit for a month, uh, sometimes there is a client who have a very small code base and uh, a great budget because the protocol is important, they, they have been well funded, and this won't be the best business decision for me. So I'm trying really hard to balance the business side of things and the actual having fun with code, um, learning more uh, newer code bases, new attack vectors and everything. I have been trying to balance it out, but last um, four or five audits uh, have been uh, I would say a smaller sized audits. Do you think if you had a team set up for the bigger audits, it would it make more sense for you at a point? Because I definitely feel the pressure if you're auditing a, a bigger code base of you know just having that much higher number of potential ways to exploit something. And sometimes I feel like if there was like an easy way to just assemble a group of high high skilled individuals on demand. A, a lot more audits would be done a lot faster with a more reasonable budget as well. 
Yeah, I think I have I have thought about this in depth. It's a hard question to answer because if I'm working with uh, more senior auditors than myself, for example, on uh, on Spearbit, I have done two audits with uh, Gerard, if you know him. Uh, he's a great auditor. He's one of the best in the space, and he, he his work is great. I mean, I love working with him. He finds a lot of issues that I, I miss and everything. So uh, if I work with him, I have a lot more confidence about the final report and everything. But still, uh, I personally have to go through each line, each character of code, and I will have to do almost the same amount of work anyway. So uh, yeah, I will still be busy for a month. And this might, if you are looking from a business perspective, this might not be the best decision. But uh, from a learning experience and from providing a great service to the client, this is probably uh, a good choice, yes. Yeah, just touching on that point that you brought out about auditing with like a more experienced auditor. How, how do you feel is the compounding effect of just auditing groups? Just being able to bounce ideas, like, do you think that we could put it in some sort of formula? Um, I think I have, I have read about uh, the way that Zach and Trust have worked before. I, I think... Uh, Lots of people in the space have read those Twitter threads, and it's very interesting the way they, they approach things and the way they work. Uh, I haven't done this specifically myself. I have worked in, on, in a team in Spearbit, but it, it was pretty good. I mean, we, we, could, we helped each other, we bounced ideas off each other. It worked well, but we didn't go into such an extent like they did. I think it works pretty well, but I have to do it more. I have to do it more because uh, I have been doing only only a few team audits and mostly doing solo audits, but I'd, I'd love to experiment with it. And I think uh, it can work well, yes. Yeah, it would be interesting to have an experiment where you get three solo auditors doing a code base, and then in, after that, you put them together and see what's the difference of like the ratio of, of vulnerabilities they find. That would be a really interesting little experiment to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I think some, some people have actually started doing this. I'm not sure. Uh, but probably some companies are already hiring a few saw auditors doing parallel audits and seeing whoever finds the most issues and they continue working with him. But but yeah, I don't know. I don't know which one is better to get the saw auditors working independently or working together. I think if people, uh, if those two auditors are very collaborative and maybe they know each other as Zach and Trust, they will do a much better job. Yeah, I think the main benefit of working as a team is you get to like help each other confirm findings instead of like completely fleshing out something before you you know write up the report or or like communicate with your team member. Um, I think that's the main benefit of working as a team, and that's um, that's what trust and as Zach alluded to when I, I spoke to I spoke to Zach. Uh, he was saying that you really need to try to share all the thoughts um, that you have like they're sitting right next to you right so you can um, sort of combine your ideas together um, it, it does save a lot of time I think uh, for me mainly I'm working with other people now it, yeah it does save time so w when I go through the code base um, I'll take notes note anything weird and if I notice something uh, I can just type in the chat. Uh, th this looks pretty strange here. Uh, let's let's take a look, um, and then whether it is an issue or is not an issue, uh, you can sort of discuss instead of having to do it completely yourself. So I, I think that is the main benefit of working as a team. And I think from the client's perspective, it it will almost always be better to get two great auditors working together for for an audit. But of course, it will probably cost twice as much. So companies have to balance it out. I mean, they don't always have the budget to get two of the best auditors in the space working on their protocol for two or three weeks, for example. It's pretty hard to do for some protocols, but it will certainly bring out one of the best results if they do this. And actually, I'll just mention ChatGPT now because, Haik, you are pretty interested in um, ChatGPT and the future implications of auditing and all that. I've actually started to use ChatGPT a little bit in my audit process just to almost as like a junior to just sort of like flesh out ideas through almost because you can use it to, it doesn't find vulnerabilities for you, right? But 
if you see some part that is very strange in the code, you can tell it to explain the code to you line by line, like the, like the function, what it does. And you can almost check its logic, like how, how ChatGPT explains it to you. And that might actually give you some ideas of whether, uh, whether there's a potential um, further uh, issue here that you can explore. So that's something that uh, I found I've started to sort of incorporate. Yeah, no, I I agree that it's definitely not nearly good enough to find anything meaningful. And I feel like sometimes you have to be careful not to shoot yourself in the foot as well. If you're relying on it to, you know, explain to you some complex part of the code base, it might end up explaining in the wrong way. So I don't rely on it too much for that. Sometimes I'll run it through to just see if it helps me clarify some things. But what I use for it the most is when um, I'm trying to understand concepts or trying to remind myself of concepts that the audit is going through. That's usually the case with more complex DeFi protocols. And they're talking about uh, different kinds of future derivatives and they all have different rules or the names of, for, for the different kinds of auctions. I think ChatGPT saves me a ton of time than having to Google. Just that the time that you're taking to like writing the proper word in Google and like go to the better link and then find the section that you need to read about to actually make sense of it. In ChatGPT, you just ask it a question and then you just, you can give it a context and it just puts it in context to you. And that has been phenomenal for me. It just speeds up that process that you're trying to understand the code base for me a lot. Yeah, it's a very interesting technology. I'm very curious about it. I can tell you something that, uh, as I said, I have done some some saw audits with some of my friends. Even one of them actually lives with me. We live together. We do Web3 security stuff and everything. And uh, I have, uh, because I'm very curious about ChatGPT, but to be honest, I'm much more curious about the actual security. I mean, I'm, I spend most, most of my time reading vulnerability reports, doing audits, whatever, even learning about the business side of things. And I have decided that I won't be... Uh, I don't know. I maybe won't get the first mover advantage here. I won't be pioneering things with ChatGPT. Maybe I will wait for you guys to, to do it right and see what you're doing and copy it or something. But yeah, I have told him, my friend, to, to try it out, uh, to be working with it and show me some interesting stuff. And I have seen some pretty valuable things. I, I mean, with Twitter, I can tell you it helps a lot. I mean, uh, if you're having a solo uh, auditing business and you want to market yourself uh, ChatGPT will help you a lot in writing good Twitter threads, good Twitter posts. Um, when it comes to security, uh, the things you mentioned are pretty interesting. I might, uh, I might actually try them someday, uh, but but haven't really put my hands on it on it yet. I'm just looking looking at it from the side and uh, getting it's getting very interesting. That's what I can say. Yeah, I think eventually it's gonna get better and better to a point that you will start finding vulnerabilities. But I don't think you would ever be, you know, at that stage, maybe not ever, but for a really long time, I think it's still gonna be very rudimentary compared to a proper human doing an audit. Yeah, I can I can find some really basic things in toy examples, but I can't actually do anything useful in actual real code bases. Yeah, and you always need this uh, good security researcher that will actually audit the ChatGPT audit. I mean, he will have to verify and invalidate the false positives and everything. So you, you need a good judgment as a, as a person always. Why don't we talk a bit about bounties uh, versus auditing? Because uh, I was just speaking to Zach a couple of weeks ago and he was saying, uh, really stuck out, stuck out to me, he said uh, the the expected value in bounties was actually higher than auditing, um, which was quite interesting now compared to a bounty compared to private audits, right? Uh, so I'm not sure have you two been um, checking out Immunified Bounties much? Uh, I know, Hake, that your uh, business partner, Django, he's pretty big into Immunify. Uh, do you work with him at all uh, on Immunify and have you done much Immunify Bounties? I haven't done much in, in Unified Bounties, but I've 
kind of being along the way with him when he was, you know, starting to unify. And like Zach mentioned, it, the aspect of having to always have that nego negotiation with the projects always put me off of it because it's, it seems to always be a thing that happens for every bounty that you submit. Uh, recently, I was just helping 100 Proof with some negotiations she was having. And because of that, it's something I wasn't personally very attracted to. Because, um, like, yeah, I just think it, it just takes a bit of a joy out of it and turns into something that drags on and puts you down. And I'd rather just focus on the doing the stuff that I like doing more. But I think if you're very like highly, highly skilled like Zach is, which he's one of the best, it's definitely worth more your hourly rate. Yeah. I, um, where do I even start? I don't know. I watched this interview with Zach and it was great. It got me very motivated. And I, this really stuck with me as well because he said basically the, the, hourly, the hourly rate is much, much higher when it comes to Minify if you are good enough and if you actually find the critical severity issue in a big protocol. But yeah, uh, I personally as well, because uh, when I was first starting uh, doing so audits, I didn't have that much confidence to to go and try to search, to look for uh, critical severity issues. And if I'm not doing my best there, trying to find the biggest bugs, not only lows and mediums, I won't be too excited about it. So that's why I went uh, to, through the path with, with so audits. But uh, lately having getting much better and finding a lot of uh, critical, a lot of high severity issues that I think would actually have been paid on Immunify if they were actually live on the deployed contract uh, on mainnet. But um, yeah, the, the, the thing that Hake said is uh, what is a bit, uh, not making me scared, but uh, I'm not that attracted to it, uh, that you have to spend a lot of time just negotiating with protocols. A lot of your great findings could be invalidated for uh, visibly no reason. And uh, I don't like this. I, I, I don't think anyone likes this. But still, I see a lot of researchers going this way, uh, this route with the bug bounties and Immunify. And it is very interesting to me. I, I mean, I'm thinking about trying this uh, this year. But uh, when the solo auditing business is going very well and I'm booked a few uh, weeks ahead, I don't really get the time to, to go through Immunify a lot. But yeah, maybe someday, maybe someday. I'm really excited about it. And I think maybe you can make uh, much more money. But it's an entirely different business model, you can call it, when it comes to economical value for you. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people post on Twitter that their issue is getting invalidated, saying it's a known issue or the contract is out of scope or, or something like that. There's always something that... Uh, it just sort of invalidates the issue, which, uh, yeah, I can definitely see that uh, it can be very frustrating. I was going to ask if you are allowed to do bug bounties being a Sigma Prime. Yes, I, I can do bug bounties. I can still do C4, uh, Sherlock. Uh, it's just the, the private audits uh, and things like uh, things like a spare, but uh, I won't be able to do. But like for me at the moment, I, I don't even like have the focus to do those sort of things too much. I kind of feel qu I'm pretty slacking, to be honest, um, this year since I've joined the order firm. Uh, I've just been sort of cruising and I haven't been like studying as hard as I w used to last year, like uh, some of you guys. So I don't know, maybe maybe it's because of the baby or because of the of the environment where, you know, like you're working at order firm, the, the pressure is sort of off um, in that scenario. But like recently I've tried, no, not, not, not recently actually, like a couple of us ago, um, I was going on a C4, I looked at a couple of Unify bounties, but I just couldn't like find myself focusing. I, I just lose focus for some reason. But uh, yeah, uh, I guess that's something that uh, I'll have to work my way uh, back into once I get a bit more time on my hands. Yeah, I was talking to Jerry V recently um, and we were just discussing that, you know, if one of us was in an auditing firm and allowed to do bug bounties would probably be what we would be doing because didn't really get the time to dive deep in a code base without any strings attached. And I think that's the most pleasurable way to go about it. 
because you're still doing your work at your auditing firm. And then in your spare time, you get to, you know, get really familiar with this one code base and then you're more likely to find a bug. And I think it just, uh, you know, takes a bit of the stress out of it. So if I was in your position, I'll probably maybe look more into it. Yeah, that, that's that's a really good point. <laughs> that that's kind of gives me motivation as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be thinking about it. How, how's your uh, work-life balance, uh, Pashoff? I know previously you said that you you work like 10 hour days and you still do a lot of study um, on your spare time. I think last month uh, you said you only audited like uh, half out of the whole month, just a couple of projects. And then you had your best month and um, I think almost your best month. And do you still do sort of uh, study on the side and like how hard do you sort of push yourself at the moment? Yeah, this is interesting. Maybe this month and last month haven't been the strongest ones when you have ups and downs with this uh, as well. And especially when you have one or two very, very strong ones that almost everything you do is work. You cannot... Uh, uh, outplay this i mean you cannot outwork this um and yeah last month i have been uh, traveling a little bit i went to uh, to france to monaco i had some fun with friends um the, this this month i already went to uh, munich for a few days and uh, yeah I, i'm enjoying some leisure time as well but um i'm still on audits almost all the time i'm just taking a little bit longer to complete them and uh putting a bit less time, less focus time on the audits. But I'm still following the space uh, pretty closely, uh, reading a lot of uh, interesting things on Twitter, reading some articles, even reading some code arena reports. Uh, but, but yeah, those past two months have been a bit more uh, life balanced, uh, but I still keep in shape and try to put uh, a few focused, focused hours each day so I don't get really out of the groove. Um, but yeah, we will see, especially with, with the summer coming, uh, pretty close. Next month I have, I have my birthday, then the summer is coming, and there will be lots of people, lots of parties, lots of fun things to do. We will see how I will handle it, because uh, yeah, there is more to, to life than security, even though this is uh, one of the main things that I do right now. Yeah, I usually do at least an eight-hour uh, work up in a day, but it varies. Um, some weeks I work a lot more than I should and I feel like I have to take it down a little bit and then for a week I'll be just, you know, a little more tame, like take a break, just go for a few more hikes. Um, yeah, I think it's important to just take your time to just decompress from the auditing because it can be a bit draining just standing in front of the computer for such long hours in a row. I definitely feel after a while, I started getting diminishing returns to a point that it kind of starts making me be worse at what I'm trying to do. So I feel like I definitely need every now and then to step back and just relax a little bit, which sometimes I don't do and just backfires. Yeah, for me, I think I can do like focused hours maybe three to four hours in the morning and then i'll take a big break and then i'll do another chunk in the afternoon or night time uh, i can't really go longer than that um, otherwise it's sort of i definitely feel the diminishing returns um, and yeah don't really focus as well uh, for sure yeah i follow a similar schedule i like like when i wake up i'm usually sharper and like just ready to go and then around lunchtime, I usually hit a slope and I can't really parse any code that I'm reading. I'm like, what am I doing here? And then I go for a walk and then I'm, when I come back, I'm like, oh, look at this. Didn't see this before. I'm not sure if you saw this, uh, patch off since you just got up in the morning, but uh, your own finance just got hacked for 10 million, <laughs> like an hour ago before we got on. Uh, yeah, it's not a dull day in uh, this Web3 security space. It's pretty crazy. Of course, yeah, I already retweeted uh, this, uh, was it Peck Shield that posted this, I don't know, but yeah, it, it's crazy. Every day there is something happening that you are not expecting, and when you think, oh, I expect everything, then something other happens, I don't know, and uh, yeah, nobody expected this hack as well, and it's another flash loan hack 
And uh, it's interesting in the first hour after a hack happens, no one knows anything. And uh, the best researchers are uh, actually analyzing the on-chain activity, analyzing the transactions, trying to deep dive into the, the problem. And now I am waiting for the post-mortem as well. It will be very interesting to see. I might even try to take a look myself, but this is another skill that um, it's, it's pretty different from auditing. I mean, in auditing, you're reading code line, line by line and analyzing an attack on chain is just uh, an entirely different skill that uh, I'm pretty interested to get, actually. I saw something related to you, to the hack, but I didn't realize it was $10 million. Uh, I saw something being sent and posted about it, and I just glanced over it because I was doing stuff, getting ready before I jumped in here. I was like, oh, I'll look at it later, but I didn't know it was that. But now I'm connecting the docs, and is it something to do with the the set a wrong address? Yeah, they, they hard coded USDT to USDT a USDC address, uh, hard coded it wrong uh, in the contract. Yeah, I've got one one of those issues once, and it was a C four contest, and not many other people got it, which was really surprising. I thought everyone would get it. So it's I don't know. It's just hard because those things, even with the best intentions, it's just a, such a e easy thing to just, you know, miss. Like you just, oh yeah, address, good. Like code it, hard coded an address, let's go. Yeah, this shows why we should, as an auditor, auditors, we should look uh, at the code, not only line by line, but character by character. I mean, we should analyze everything, really, really everything. And uh, especially at those places that you do not expect issues, this is how the developers are thinking as well. They're thinking as uh, as normal humans. They're saying, oh, this cannot be, uh, cannot have mistakes in it, cannot have bugs. But exactly there, because of this mindset, it is very possible that it has bugs. Yeah, I like something that I trust said once of never, never assuming something is right just because it's there. Like just never assume something's working just because there. I think that's really valuable piece of device. And I can see that this issue can be missed during an audit as well because it's like a really mundane thing that you have to do a checklist for to see this type of issue because as an auditor you'll be looking into the logic, into the business logic, into um, all these other interesting attack parts. But then here's a the thing where you just have to be very meticulous with the your your checklist type of things that you go through uh, during order to be able to pick this one up. Yeah, something similar that I see happening every now and then is um, addresses between chains. So they they're gonna use the token address of Ethereum, but they're deploying on Polygon and things like that. Every now and then something like that always pops up in audits. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. And uh, I think, yeah, a checklist should help here. Uh, you can add this uh, to check each address on each chain and everything. But uh, for example, what I have done in my auditing process is I, I really, really read the code uh, character by character. I mean, I, I start from the license comment, even validate this, then go through each import, check manually if it's used, how it, how it is used, and then go through the, uh, even check if the contract name matches the file name and everything, then go through each storage variable and see how it is used, just a little bit, not get into depth, but to see if it is used and what its value is. And uh, another thing that I thought of here is those values were hard coded here, but what if they were just uh, constructor arguments? I mean, how would you have audited this? You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't audit it. You wouldn't have audited this unless the company actually does a deployment script audit, which is another thing. And I think this this has a place as well uh, in a, in the security pipeline of a, of a protocol. Yeah, no, I think auditing deploy scripts. If you can include your deploy script in the audit, it's very very valuable because there are so many protocols where things have to be initialized in a certain order. And then if one tiny thing, it's set up to the wrong value, then you're toast. Do you guys usually have a way to go through the contracts when you start an audit? So for me personally, I like to start at the smaller contracts 
and wake my work my way up to the bigger contracts. Because by the time that I get to the more complex logic, I already have a bunch of contacts from the small contracts. I was wondering if you guys do something like that or you're just jumping right in. Um, for me, I've actually started using the same. I go through the smaller contracts first. Um, and once you, yeah, yeah like you said, I, I found that pretty useful to, to get sort of a context around the, around the protocol. And it's also a really good um, way to boost your confidence as well that you're, you're understanding the protocol as you go through the smaller uh, bits of contracts. Yeah, I do mostly the same. I usually start with the smaller contracts for basically two reasons. One is the same as you, uh, that you said um, you, you start to gain some context and actual understanding of a complete contract when you uh, go through the smaller ones. And uh, just another big thing is for the psychological win. I mean, when you actually start checking off some of the contracts in the code base and then you got just one or two big contracts to review, uh, you're much more, more motivated, I guess, to, to go into them. And if you have like uh, 10 contracts to review, it's a bit scary. So uh, I, I do this. I, I go through the smaller ones first. Then And, and, and I even set, uh, I even check it in my list that uh, this contract has been reviewed. And if I see it interacting in some weird way with the bigger contracts, I'll go back to it. But, but still, I know I have reviewed most of it. And it feels good to have just one or two contracts to review in the end. Um, do you guys have a sort of audit process that you go through and has that changed much during this year? Uh, I know, Hank, you started a Code Arena, I think roughly around the same time as me, right? I started in April uh, last year. Um, has your audit process changed much um, during this year? Uh, and uh, what sort of uh, parts in your process do you find are most useful? Well, it definitely changed from April last year when we just got started for sure. Um, yeah, I know. I think at first there were, there's just so many things to learn. You don't you don't even think about like having an audit auditing process. You're just trying to figure out what is what is anything. But as you start to learn more about DeFi protocols and like get familiar with things that are commonly forked and just building this intuition, this infrastructure in your mind. I started building just this, in, this process naturally. It's not something that I sat down and thought about it. And I think that's how it happens for most auditors, I imagine, that you just want to have a plan and tackle the the code base in a way that you can understand it. So that means for me that in some audits, I'll either read a lot of the documentation first until I have a good bird's eye overview of what the code is supposed to do. And then I'll dig into the code. But some other times when there's no documentation or the documentation is poorly written, I rather go and read the code first because that's going to give me a better idea of what this thing is actually supposed to do. So my mindset when I'm starting an audit is just have a feel of what is the most efficient way that I can understand what this thing is supposed to do from a bird's eye view. Once I have that figured out, then I'll dive into the code, um, read through it, like first, first pass through, go tagging issues, looking for syncs. And once I go... I go line by line first time, read it through, and then go for other passes, looking at the things that I tagged and then really trying to brainstorm how can I make this work or not work, you know? Uh, how can I bring this thing based on these issues that I spotted and how can I make it worse? Yeah, and by the end of it, if I really feel like there's something here that I can really get a hold of, I would do fuzzing and try to use some tools to see if I can pick a hole somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it has certainly changed. I mean, in the beginning when I was starting out, I was just uh, scrolling to the through the contract files and just looking for some common vulnerabilities, like some patterns that I have seen, um, some QA issues on Code Arena, or even um, there was this uh, very common issue where a lot of uh, financial protocols are using um, 
Chainlink oracles. So when they integrate with the Oracle, they do not properly validate the input, the, the price that they are getting. And uh, this was a very common vulnerability. I think I have found it multiple times, but this is something that I was looking for. I mean, I was just scrolling through files and looking for common vulnerabilities. Yeah, this is, this is how you start out and it's a great way to start. Uh, this way you can uh, easily find some vulnerabilities, bring your confidence up, actually make some money, even though now this exact vulnerability will probably pay you 10 cents, maybe. maybe. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, but I even nowadays, I still do something similar where I go back to the code base, to the, to the vulnerability base from C4 and Sherlock mm-hmm. when I'm looking at something that I've seen something similar before. And I just try to see if there's something similar that I can do to this code base because, you know, it's a familiar bug. So I definitely think it's valuable still to check past code bases. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh... Even one of my last audits that I did was uh, some vesting contract, and uh, I have been doing some some vesting audits on Code Arena, for example, this VTVL pro- protocol. They did vesting implementation in smart contracts. So I, I read their report and I basically compa- compared their findings with my findings, and I actually verified that some problems are existing in both code bases. But uh, it was a good thing that I have actually have found them because I have read this report multiple times. But yeah, this is very valuable. And uh, yeah, my process my process has changed a lot, especially after actually realizing that the best way to do the, the best audit is to really understand the protocol really well. I mean, you have to be able to basically implement it yourself if you have enough time, or at least you can uh, very honestly answer to yourself that you know the protocol at least. Uh, you, you can explain it at around 90 or 95 percent. You understand it. Then I think you you have um, made a good audit. And what I was saying uh, just a second earlier was that I have started writing some uh, technical documentation in my audits, uh, explaining what the protocol does, uh, how is it used, some interesting things in the protocol, and actually creating something like a threat model, like just listing the privileged roles, the actors in the protocol. And uh, this has helped me a lot uh, thinking like a, a, a black hat and just looking at the protocol, what, like what are its goals? What is it trying to accomplish? Because you can find a lot of problems with this usually. Previously, we mentioned about pattern matching on Code Arena. I think that's something we all did uh, when we just started on Code Arena. But actually, that might be a pretty good approach to Immunify because uh, I know you are a big fan of Riptide, uh, Pashoff. That he, uh, I saw some of his tweets, and uh, um, I may be wrong, but I think he has a sort of a feeling of a protocol might be vulnerable f- for this type of attack. I mean, he would go to that protocol and see if it, it is vulnerable for um, to that type of attack. Um, I think that will actually save a lot of time. You don't actually have to go through the whole protocol and understand it completely. You just need to know that attack vector very, very well and be able to apply it to uh, a lot of different protocols. Um, so that's actually, that, that might actually be a pretty a pretty good approach uh, to try. Something that I like to do sometimes, which is similar to pattern matching, is try and find out if the same team has had an audit before for either the same or different code base and trying to see what kind of issues were found in that past audit. And sometimes you can kind of get a feel of how this team writes the code and trying to look for issues in a similar direction just because it's the same team. So they probably have the same biases. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting thing. And I have thought about this way. I have actually spoken to uh, one other great researcher in the space uh, who has his own company and everything. And uh, because I saw that he's doing mainly audits and everything, and I asked, have you tried Immunify? And he told me that actually, yes, and he has made great money with it because he was one of the early guys that discovered this book. Um, I'm sure you know it. Uh, the the vote shares calculation book where you can front run the first depositor and steal all of his money. So this is a very common, uh, common book, and it was in actually... It, it is present in most ERC 4626 implementations, and you can almost always report it. And it has a very high um, 
high impact. I mean, you can steal uh, money from a depositor without any preconditions. You just have to be the first one. Uh, the likelihood is a bit lower because it's harder to implement, but still, it's, it's at least a high severity or maybe a critical severity issues, issue. And uh, this guy told me that he reported the same bug to all protocols when the bug was first discovered, and he made some crazy money with it. I don't know how much, but probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, I expect. And um, yeah, there is a lot of pattern matching in Immunify available as well. And I think this is, uh, people are, uh, are not using it this very much. And there is a lot of value staying there. And you actually help the protocols resolve some issues and you'll make a lot of money. But uh, yeah, there is opportunity cost with this as well. So that's why I'm not trying it, but it's very interesting to think about. Yeah, I definitely have to come through a lot of audits nowadays to get those pattern matching opportunities. I feel like just a year ago, it would be a lot easier, but now you're just getting the the protocols are getting more and more sophisticated security wise, I think, which is good. But but there still are uh, a lot of protocols where you open their audit and it says no vulnerabilities found. <laughs> I mean, there are uh, great companies with, with good brands and good names that are posting those type of types of audits on a daily basis. I mean, more than twice a week, they have an audit with no vulnerabilities found, some informational ones like unused storage variable or whatever. I, I don't know. If you see a company like this, uh, I think you should just uh, straight up go to, I mean, a protocol that has had an audit like this, you should straight up go to their ether scan. And if the source code is verified, you almost certainly find at least a medium severity issue. I don't know. At least that's what I'm taking. But uh, those companies are not taking security that seriously, probably, and uh, probably won't be on Immunify and might not even pay you a bounty if you report a bug to them. It might be a good way to build up your reputation if you want to do private audits, though. Uh, you can sort of hunt for these sort of bugs and post it on Twitter. And, yeah, it's an interesting idea for, for people who are trying to sort of build up their uh, private auditing uh, business. Yeah, it's interesting to see that some protocols see security purely from a, a how do you call it, a, like a marketing perspective. It's just like a public relationship stunt for a lot of companies. And then that's what a lot of times end up costing them all, the, all of their business eventually. Yeah, uh, actually, there is a, an interesting small niche in, uh, especially on uh, the Binance. What what was it called? In on the BS chain, uh, the Binance chain. Um, I mean, there are a lot of rug pull protocols there. And uh, lots of them are getting these low quality audits that are just some PDF files saying uh, no vulnerabilities, no way to wreck the protocol or whatever. And there is a lot of business with this as well. I mean, if you are an auditor, you don't have to be a very skilled one, but uh, you can scale this business very easily. I mean, you can do tens of those audits each day. And I know some companies that are actually doing this and they are making, for example, they can make up to 2K an audit and the audit is basically just auto automatically generated PDF saying no vulnerabilities. And people are making money this way. Uh, I don't know it's, if it's morally good, but uh, it's interesting. It's almost like uh, you're part of the rug pull crowd. Uh, if you're doing something like this, you're, you're pretty much making money out, out of the people that the project is rugging. Yeah, not, not a good thing, certainly. I remember, I remember Safe Moon. I don't know if you have read uh, the first Safe Moon contracts audit, but they had some very interesting stuff. I mean, they don't, they didn't have a transfer ownership function, uh, but there was some other way to to transfer the ownership. Um, no, uh, they had a way to revoke it, so no one will be the owner of the contract. But there was a way in the pause function or whatever to to regain ownership of the contract. And this was actually um, reported by Certic on their audit, I think, which was good of them. But uh, I don't think they, they mentioned that this is, I don't know if they mentioned if it is a rug pull attack vector. But yeah, it was interesting. Lots of scammy projects and uh, you have to be careful as an auditor to not take on those maybe. Yeah, I think this issue of anything related to owner, tra owner transfers or like malicious keys or like ways uh an admin can rug the protocol are usually downplayed but i think it's a serious issue um we saw in the report a few months ago that the highest 
um, attack vector in terms of funds stolen has been through leak of private keys. And I think just generally as an industry, those issues should be treated more seriously. I recently started offering operational security with my audits as well. And just to try and help projects mitigate that, because I think it's something is not usually talked about. And sometimes, you know, you we hear about operational security, but unless you're really trying to get your stuff sorted, you're not going to come across uh, a tutorial or or an easy way how to set up your protocol properly. Yeah, I agree. This, this is a great point. Great point. And, and also, it's interesting how users, when they think about centralization problems, they just think they, they can trust the, the owner, the deployer, that he is not malicious. But it's not just maliciousness. As you said, it's more of a compromise problem. I mean, the, the guy who holds the private key and the power to the contract might be a very good guy, a morally um, good person. But uh, if he's not great in uh, keeping his private key actually private, uh, bad things can happen. So I don't even think uh, users realize this very well. Yeah, with these like owner rug and uh, these type of issues, yeah, some some projects obviously, if if they're honest, they don't really appreciate you saying, "Oh, you can rug this," and <laughs> and it's it's pretty obvious as well uh, that they can rug it. So uh, to them, sometimes it's not really that useful uh, over finding. Yeah, I think a lot of the times that felt like, "Oh, it's okay, it won't happen to us," you know, is the kind of thing you think, "Oh, it will never happen to us. We're not idiots." You're not going to click scammy links. But then one day you're just like, get this email. Oh, look, this is a nice pair of shoes that, you know, are on sale. And then you click on it and then boom, all your money is gone. Uh, it's, it's honestly not that hard, especially like they, they these scammers are not stupid. You know, you, they can see on chain how much money your protocol has and how much money you are responsible for. And for a lot of these guys, it's very easy to connect one and two together and see like, oh, that's the guy who's in control of this key. So it lets you just target them. And then just, they do a whole profiling on you, see what kind of things you like, send you something that you click on and you think nothing of it. So I think, you know, you don't have to be super stupid to fall for that kind of thing. Every now and then you see someone that's like big in the industry fall for one of the scams. And I don't think it's by accident, you know, yeah, it's actually pretty hard um, to, you know, if someone is targeting you with uh, s specifically with a phishing attempt and they're going to try over and over and over again until you click on a link, it's actually pretty hard to avoid it. Um, you, you have to be vigilant like 100% all the time. I hope it never happens to us, but everything is possible. Even some great security researchers have been hacked. Um, we just have to be careful and do our best. But uh, there are a lot of ways that you can protect yourself, especially your private key. You can build, build walls around it. And uh, if you are a founder of a protocol that has, that his private key has a lot of control in the protocol, and uh, there are mu multiple millions of dollars of total value locked in it, you should certainly take steps in, in this direction and have a budget to spend in terms of time and money uh, securing this thing. Yeah, I think the operational security is always very inconvenient. It's like there's no convenience to it. Like you know, the more secure you want to be on the front, the more inconvenient it is. And I think that puts a lot of people off until it's too late. And then maybe the industry should try to, you know, teach everyone that that's something that we just have to go through and make more of a social norm that certain things should be set in place when you're deploying something. I actually think, by the way, I think Howborn or some company actually started offering this service where they actually print you some kind of a certificate. I don't really expect uh, respect certificates too much, but they had a very nice process of uh, uh, exactly uh, implementing a process of keeping your private key uh, safe 
like following a checklist or whatever, where they rate your internal process of operational security related to the private keys. And this is a move in, a, in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, it's going back to the uh, not forgetting about traditional cybersecurity concepts when we're always focused on the Web3 side of things day to day. Uh, yeah, you tend to forget uh, the base layer, which is like traditional cybersecurity concepts, right? I'm not sure. I think the running hack was the biggest one yet, and it was uh, just a, a phishing hack, as far as I remember. It was a private key compromise of multiple people. So this this gives us enough information that we should put some time and effort into it. So have you guys uh, got any goals for 2023? Yeah, I think the the goal that I'm more excited about is to get the summon up and running again and see if we can get um, make a more meaningful impact in the industry. I think we have some ideas that could significantly impact the industry a lot more than I could myself as an auditor. So impact-wise, I think that's where I could make the most difference in if it pans out. So I'm really excited about testing that theory. And on the auditing side, just auditing interesting protocols I, I I love when I find something that I find that could make people's lives easier or better in a way. I think a lot of things that we come across when auditing are just a fork of a fork or just a, a slight little change. But every now and then you come across a protocol, and you're like, oh, that is really cool. And then I get really obsessed with it. So just looking forward to more of those moments, I guess. Yeah, from my side, I don't know. Uh... Things are moving pretty fast in this space. When I was starting this year, I had no idea that I would be here uh, having such great business months and providing so much value to multiple clients, which I'm very happy about. But uh, now I'm thinking more about in terms of partnerships. I think uh, I'm, I'm preparing some one or two partnerships with some uh, names in the space where I think uh, I will be able to work with with other people so i can provide more more value to the space overall um uh, and yeah this this will be great i just want to serve the community better have fun myself live a nice life uh, i will be visiting some conferences i'll be going to montenegro next month uh, for edcon and then on, in july i will be in DeFi security summit i hope i will see you there maybe and then ecc in paris those will be some great events I hope I will meet some nice people there, have fun. And uh, yeah, the, ho the whole year will be Web3 security, I'm certain. I will, do, I will try to do three things. Basically, provide a lot of value to the community as much as I can by working hard myself and partnering with the, with the other great people. And I will try to do the best business decisions for myself, try to make the most money, providing the most impact. And of course, have fun. Have fun, meet cool people, uh, get nice moments in your life. That's it. I won't be able to do uh, any conferences this year. I don't think, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, like speaking to you guys, I've actually you know given me motivation to try and unify. Yeah, you, you do. Hake, you you mentioned previously like yeah, working at an auto firm and doing unify is probably like a really good balance of things because um, I thought, you know, like watching you guys, like especially Pashov and all, all the other guys who recently like quit their traditional cybersecurity job and um, started doing private audits. I was thinking maybe perhaps if I stayed at my old uh, cybersecurity job and then I started uh, doing private audits uh, whether things would be different. And uh, I was like, yeah, maybe I'm almost getting a bit of like a bit of like a FOMO, like watching you guys <laughs> crushing it in the industry. But uh, yeah, I think the, the Immunify option is a really good one for me and uh, definitely something uh, for me to consider. Yeah. Andy, are you uh, using a lot of Foundry? And you said you are doing uh, a lot of uh, proof concepts in your in your day to day job, right? Yeah. So mostly, yeah, mostly we use we either use Foundry or we use Brownie, which is like a Sigma Prime used Brownie like way back and we've always used it and recently a lot of projects are moving to foundry and the auditors a lot of auditors prefer to use foundry so actually we've started to slowly migrate more to foundry which uh, i do enjoy uh, using a bit more yeah then really i 
I don't know. If I was in your shoes, that's what I would have been doing. I would have been doing a lot of Immunify on the site because uh, this is very exciting. I mean, there is a very high risk to reward ratio. And uh, I mean, if you are good with Foundry, you can write great proof of concepts. So protocols will have um, less, uh, less reasons to say, no, this bug is invalid or whatever. This will help you a lot and yeah. I would put more time and effort into it if I was in your shoes. Yeah, I have a theory. Uh, I just started testing it this week that writing POCs is probably one of the best ways to get better security. Um, I got this uh, junior auditor under my wing and I'm basically just started giving him assignments. So he basically just does a, like a pass audit and then just regular manual audit, see if he finds anything, then go for the for the actual findings. And then uh, I get him to do a POC for every finding or at least any relevant finding. And I still, like it's still early stages. We haven't got, finished the first assignment yet, but I think my theory is that this helps you just build intuition and get familiar with protocols at a much deeper level. And I just wanna, to hear what you guys think about this approach that I'm taking with this student that I just took on. Yeah, I, I do agree that uh, writing POCs is uh, a good way to learn security. I've um, heard multiple different people mention that uh, writing POCs is like training your security muscles. Uh, like I noticed, patch off like your, uh, when you do private audits, uh, do you write any POCs uh, as part of your audits or do you uh, mostly just do a manual review and and just uh, write out the findings like a C4 contest? Yeah, so with proof concepts, I think it's a bit of a trade-off because uh, especially if the protocol is not written in the framework that you're good at, uh, if it's not in Foundry, for example, it will be much harder to, to write a proper proof of concept and it will take a lot of time. Sometimes protocols do not even have great testing suits. You have to do some configurations. You have to do some deployment of the contracts or whatever. And uh, it will take a lot of your time. So I have I have now done over uh, 15 solo audits, I think. And um, I haven't been doing proof of concept with tests. I'm just explaining how the issue would work. and. It is possible that maybe some issues are not even exploitable. This is entirely possible, of course, when you're not doing an actual test to verify it. But uh, this way, I have more times to more time to actually find more vulnerabilities, and it has worked well for me. Uh, I think I think a lot of uh, a lot of companies, security companies, are doing this uh, though this this way. They're not really writing proof of concept and. Um, you set in Sigma, Sigma Prime, you actually write proof of concepts for most issues, which is a great thing. But of course, this adds a lot of uh, overhead in terms of time. And uh, yeah, I don't think it, it fits in the best way in the solo audit category, but uh, it's something that I, I'm really curious and interested to experiment with. And that's why, that's one of the reasons I also want to try Munify because there I will try to actually write some nice proof of concepts. And actually there is another thing. Um, I, I think I have found one bug on Immunify, which is just a medium severity bug. It's probably not exploitable, but it can be exploited maybe some someday in a very complex situation. And I haven't even reported it because uh, I, will ha I would have to put a lot of time and effort into writing a proof of concept. And otherwise it, it will be invalidated probably. I have thought about just reporting it to the protocol just so they know, but uh, we'll see. But I'm not spending much time writing proof of concepts, to be honest, no. There's something that I sometimes think about, which is how projects could manage prevention instead of mitigation of exploits. I think a lot of the focus on security after it goes through an audit is on the mitigation of an exploit. So let's say you get an audit and let's say you, get a, you put up a bug bounty and that's it. That's your final security setup. And anything that happens after that, you're trying to, like if an exploit happens after that, your focus is on how to deal with that exploit. So, you know, Sherlock, for example, they have the insurance and that would be a, a sort of mitigation to an exploit. 
And I think we should be looking the other way more often to prevention of exploits, uh, active prevention of exploits. Of course, an audit is a form of prevention, but I think it shouldn't end there. I think active prevention should be preferred and will always be better than mitigation at the other end. You know, it's kind of, if you think about uh, health, exercising and eating well works a lot better than just having to go for a surgery, you know, a few years later. So I think in general, if we could look at that instead of mitigations more often, we would be in a better place. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think uh, when it comes to learning security, uh, things are not very systemized in the space and most of the people are learning through Coderino reports, Sherlock reports, securing bootcamp. And this is one of the reasons why I, I, I started participating in this course that uh, Johnny did in our space. We, he's building this smart contract hacking course. And I have actually uh, told him that we can uh, start proposing this to companies so they train their developers because I think a lot of developers come from Web2 without much experience in Web3, without almost any. I know personally because I worked as a Web3 developer writing Solidity and then some Cairo for like nine months or whatever. And I wasn't as good with security as I am now. I probably have uh, written some vulnerable code, I don't know, but uh, I hope not. But um, it has been audited, so probably not. It it has been fixed, but uh, but still, uh, I think the the problem stems from there. Lots of developers do not know even the basic things about Web3 security. They slip bad bugs, which are pretty obvious to even junior auditors. So I think developer training would uh, play a big role in this. This would scale the Web3 security space a lot. Yeah. Mm. So you're talking about uh, integrating security. Uh, in the development process, sort of like traditional cybersecurity, DevSecOps? Yeah, something something maybe a bit different because uh, this DevSecOps is not, I, I don't think most companies have this role, just some some of the biggest companies have it. But uh, in, in normal web to development, developers know nothing about security, absolutely nothing. I have been a, a developer doing pretty well, writing some backend code. But apart from uh, integrating the front end with the back end, knowing some of those things, you do not know really much else. But when it comes to Web3 development here, it is crucial. I mean, all of the code that you write is holding money and it's public on the blockchain and everyone can exploit it. So it's much more crucial. crucial. And here, I don't know if it should even be called a developer. It's not just a developer. I mean, you have to have a lot of other skills to actually create a good protocol here. So maybe it's hard that this would have to be one person, everybody to know to write Solidity and to audit code. But I don't know, I think most auditors here that are doing well in the space would actually be pretty good developers. But I wouldn't say the same uh, for developers will be good auditors. So maybe we will see some some change here. Yeah, that's actually quite an interesting point um, you mentioned about uh, auditors transitioning into developers. Uh, like from what I've noticed, a lot of people, there has been a lot of people on Twitter saying they are brand new, they're jumping into security, but I don't see the same number of people uh, brand new jumping into uh, a, like a Web3 developer. Uh, maybe because it's it's like there is a sort of gatekeeping there to become a developer or something. and. And uh, in terms of uh, auditing, you can just jump straight in and then if you provide value, you can get paid and um, there's no gatekeeper, you just provide value and then that's, you know, you, you can just do, do the work, right? Um, and that also translates well if you want to become a developer later. So that's a really interesting thing about uh, being involved in Web3 security. We really, really do owe everything to Code Arena and I think to your videos as well. This this was the game changer. I mean, without Code Arena, and even for myself personally, without your videos to give me some confidence to actually go on Code Arena and try to uh, submit some QA and gas reports, things wouldn't be the same. I, I mean, there aren't, aren't many security researchers. How many are we? Maybe a thousand uh, or two thousand or three thousand right now that are doing something meaningful. And I think probably uh, more than a thousand of, uh, 
probably like 40% of them have gone through Code Arena and uh, have started there. Maybe, I don't know the exact statistics, but yeah, we really owe a lot to Code Arena and to, you, to yourself as well. I think that. <laughs> Appreciate it. I was about to say exactly the same thing. I was about to mention C4 and just, you know, say that this model really changed the way this industry works because it took all the smoke and mirrors out of the security way. And now we can just see with full transparency what's what, who is good, who is not good, and what to what you can expect from a security audit. If you have if you're dealing with, you know, thing with auditors that are supposed to be good, what your security audit is supposed to look like. So yeah, it definitely uh, changed the industry for for the better for sure. And your videos also helped me as well. Uh, we started pretty much the same time, so. For me, it was more like a competition that I had with yourself. It was more like, oh, I'll do better than him this time <laughs> or something like that. Uh, yeah, but he definitely had an impact on me as well, for sure. Yeah, I think we started exactly at the same time. I think you, me, Django, and 100 Proof, I think we were part of the same cohort in C4 in a way. Yeah. Yeah, but we like when we got in, I still felt we got in pretty late. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, like like looking back now, uh, I don't feel this. We got in late. I I think that you know the opportunity that um, the the Web three security space has provided us has been you know tremendous. Yeah, I think back in the day when you hopped in the Discord channel, you would know all the names. They'll all be familiar, and you would kind of you know expect some people to say some kind of things. It was like a a low enough number of people that you could form relationships with them. Um, and I think nowadays there's so many people that you don't get that, that sort of opportunity. Um, I certainly think it would be a lot harder for me to form the friendships or relationships that I formed back in the days before with you and 100 Proof and all those other guys. I think being that at the time definitely facilitated that kind of camaraderie to, to form. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and something I can add to this is uh, what I really love about Code Arena and uh, such platforms is the permissionless permissionlessness. So basically, uh, I run a small uh, IT community here in Bulgaria, helping people progress in their careers and whatever. And I don't know if you have felt this, but there is uh, the Bulgarian presence in the Web3 space, Web3 security space, has been growing a lot. And uh, there are people from this community now that have. Some of them are like 18, 19, 20 years old, and they're making great money and providing great value to the space. Uh, some of them actually have been winning Code Arena contests even. One of them won a Code Arena contest getting $8,000 first place. Uh, another guy is getting multiple solo audit clans per month, uh, other ones as well. So here you can see that there are a lot of people that are... because. A lot of people are from small countries or are, or have smaller age. Uh, age. I mean, when you're 18, no company will take you seriously. They are saying you have no experience or whatever. Or when you live in Bulgaria, lots of companies are just not hiring here. But maybe you are the great, the best guy for them. You will provide a lot of value. Uh, and here is the perfect place for this. Anyone can permissionlessly uh, go on Codorino or on such platforms and provide value and get paid. And I have seen. 18, 19 year old guys uh, getting paid very well, providing a lot of value, changing their life. It's it's a beautiful thing. I love it. Yeah, that that's incredible to hear. Myself personally as well. I mean, I'm a young guy in in uh, Eastern Europe, and I'm making great money, providing value. Clients are happy. It's a great thing. Uh, well, it's been awesome chatting with you guys. Uh, thanks for coming on, Hake and Pashoff. Uh, second time on for you, Pashoff. Maybe uh, there will be a third time uh, very soon. <laughs> and uh, th thanks, thanks for organizing this, Hake. Uh, you, you, you gave me the idea of sort of um, doing this format where we get multiple people on and just chat about security stuff and be a sort of hacker hangout. So yeah, if, if more people are interested, uh, we can uh, do more of these things more regularly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, thank you for having us. Um, didn't do any organizing, really. It's all you. Uh, so thanks, man. Uh, it's been great. And hopefully we can get more guys in here next time.
Thank you, thank you as well for hosting us. It was very nice. Pleasure.